Hey, Sanctus Church, good morning. So glad that you're joining us. Welcome to our last sort of mini installment on Romans before we enter into a full-on Advent season. Now, you all heard the story of Moses, my cat, and how he was a gift I did not want, and he was given to me on Father's Day, and there's all the drama behind that. Well, as you know, I've come to love Moses, and now Moses and I are best friends. There is a new uh, drama unfolding, though, with Moses the cat. He's a a skinny little black barn cat. He's like this big, and he's wiry, and he's full of fun. He acts more like a dog, which, in my opinion, is a good thing. But now he wants to escape all the time. He constantly wants to escape to the outside. Last week, one day, he escaped, I think, six times. And he strategically hides behind jackets and, and uh, uh, shoes. And just he just is positioned, and he's so quick. And he loves running outside. And then he runs, and he's running through leaves, and I suppose he's trying to hunt something. And he's running through trees, and our whole family's running after him, trying to save him from himself. See, Moses believes in his heart. That freedom is outside of the house. Freedom is out there. And when he goes out there, he's going to fill his life with everything he's ever wanted. We know that he's a little cat who's young and dumb and doesn't understand that if he goes out there, his life out there is going to be way less exciting and way less nice than it is inside. And actually, if he stays out there pretty long, he's going to die. It's that simple. He is going to die. And so we continually run in the forest or the trees and the leaves to save him from himself. You're like, John, why are you telling me some cat therapy story? Here's what I'm telling you. That image of thinking that freedom is over there outside of the safety of the house is the image I want very close in your mind and your heart today as we come to this significant passage In Romans. It's actually the second half of Romans 5. This is one of the greatest theological sections in the entire Bible. Genesis to Revelation. This little section. In 10 verses, Paul is going to summarize chapter 1 through chapter 5. In some massive broad sweep, he's going to talk about our fallenness, opportunity for freedom, rescue, that God's given through Jesus, of course, if we want him. But our story today does not begin with us or our sin or our brokenness or our attempts to escape, nor does it start with Jesus. It goes back, back, back to the beginning, to this place we've all heard of called Eden, paradise. Adam, Eve, God, animals, creation, peace, harmony, relationship, the way life was supposed to be. Shalom, work, recreation, sex, life, heaven, earth, the seen and unseen, unified at one point. It was the Lord's prayer unsaid before it was lost. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This utopia was not a dream or myth. It was reality, but it was shattered by the second great incursion of evil into God's creation, which he had, of course, deemed very good. Our story begins in Genesis 2.9. The Lord God made... All kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So beautiful and vast and inspiring and amazing food. And out of this original forest, out of this divinely div- divinely designed garden, out of this first orchard, among this vast variety of trees, flower and fruit, there are two trees that are not like all the other trees. In the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life. And also, there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Why are these two trees so unique? And John, why are they even in the garden in the first place? Is it even fair that they're there? Well, okay. Let's just start with the tree of life. We're told that if you eat from it, you actually live eternally. Now, the idea is not that you eat from it just once and then you're eternal. The idea is you had to keep eating from it. And as you continued eating from it, then you would keep moving forward eternally. Humans, unlike God, of course, having starting point, but they were meant to be eternal from the point of their origin. Now, there's another, another tree nearby, same garden, different understanding, good and evil. We'll get to that tree in a moment. But at this moment, before we get to that moment, all is right. God in love has spoken these words to our great, great, great times, whatever grandparents in Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And then it says in verse 25, Adam and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. So you've got creation and relationship with God and life and warning among the trees. And to top it all off, if you read that section, the very first wedding happens. I've shared this before. Maybe you don't know this. Here is the first time where a father walks a daughter down the aisle and gives her away to her husband. That's where that idea in churches comes from, right here. And as he walks towards her and her to him, never miss the power of what's declared. Both Eve and Adam, both made in the image of God, both have full unfettered access to God. They're different. Gender and this complementary setup is God's idea. And yet they are with God equally. So Adam and Eve are with each other. They're naked, no shame, no guilt, no self-hate, no feelings of inadequacy. There's nothing between them. There's no wrong motives, no hidden agenda. They are physically, emotionally, sexually, spiritually connected. And notice... They, in creation, are also good. No danger from animals, no natural disasters, no disease, no famine, no pollution, no death of any sort. And they also walked with God. Perfect, honest, uninterrupted relationship. And, oh, this is wild. They talked to God. They didn't talk about God. And they talked to each other. They didn't talk about each other. And here, they believed They knew they experienced what every single love song cries out for, what every single cry of an injustice longs for. They had this elusive thing called peace. There was no need for the language, let alone the experience of things like salvation, redemption, deliverance, recovery, escape, rescue. Condemnation just didn't exist. Okay, into all that goodness, do not miss what God, their father, God, their creator, warns them. Don't eat of that one tree. You ever thought about this? Ever mused? Ever wondered? Ever asked out loud? Why in the world did God place that there in the first place? Is this some like just really like evil cosmic setup? Is God basically some jerk tempting us, giving us some option he knows we cannot handle? Is he like a really controlling out of sort of like out of control, cruel father wanting his children, children to mess up, testing us to see how strong we are. And when we actually fall down, he mocks us and beats us down and says, what's wrong with you? Why don't you step up to the plate? No, not at all. We're made in the image of God. So choice is a must. Choice affirms us. Choice reflects us. It shows us who God really is and actually who we really are. Without choice, we are not human. Without choice, we're just robot or animal. Yet we know that we're more than just animal. We do not just function out of instinct alone. But where there's choice, there's option. Where there's option, there's risk. So all was good and all was great and all was perfect. The safety of the house was there. And then enter stage left, Satan. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. Oh, don't read that too quickly and miss it. Satan is made. He has a beginning also. He is among, part of, connected to creation. There's no equality here. There's no yin and yang. There's not two before creation. There's just one, God. I'm sure Satan took his time, calculated the very right moment, I mean, he is, have you ever thought about this? He is the first hunter tracking prey in the forest ever. Eve and Adam walking by the forbidden tree, suddenly he speaks. They turn the conversation, innocent feeling. Yet behind those eyes, those most beautiful eyes of this most beautiful creature, there are scars of a war that he's already lost in the heavenlies. And he thinks this is the way I can get back to the heavens and also insult and attack my arch enemy. Satan says, To Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? For the first time in human history, exaggeration takes place. Any tree? Underneath he plants seeds that God is restrictive and God is jealous and God is not trustworthy. And the snake looks into her dark brown eyes looking to see if she's buying into the lie, looking to see if she's slowly being dragged away from her maker and suddenly... You can see the change is happening. Eve corrects him, sort of. Well, we may eat from the fruit from the trees in the garden. Oh, but God did say to us, you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. 
Because if you do those things, you die. Now, here's the crazy thing. Eve, did you just catch it? She just exaggerated herself. She is now starting to imitate the tempter, not God. God did never, God never said, you, you touch it and die. He just said, if you eat it, you die. Satan is watching Eve's every move. Satan, I'm sure, acted so surprised, so shocked, puts on the greatest show on earth. Oh, poor Eve, you don't understand. I know the inner thoughts of God. I was there before you even existed, and I know God better than you do. And, and, and then at this moment, exaggeration forms and evolves into the very first lie ever uttered in human history. You, Genesis 3, 4, I think it is, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to Eve. God is a liar and God is spiteful and God is self-promoting and he's obsessive and he's mean and he's uncaring and he cannot and should not be trusted. And, and did you catch it? <laughs> For the first time ever, God is not at the center of anything. For the first time, the conversation is about God, not to him. Oh, death is not going to happen. The snake lied. There's no real threat. There's nothing to worry about. God's a fraud and he's a fake. He's a pretender. He's an imposter. He's a hypocrite. And let me tell you why he cannot be trusted. For God knows mm, that when you eat from that tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Oh, oh, Eve, Adam, listen up. You, you eat from that tree, you will be like God. You should be like God. We should all be like God. Disobedience brings blessing, breaking God's law, and your relationship is the best thing you can do. It's going to bring the most positive results. And this mixture of like misquotation, denial, slander is meant to seduce. You will be more than you are now. You'll be more than God intended you to be. You can cross lines of the creator that he's drawn and he cannot stop you, nor should he stop you. He's weaker than you think. And of course, Satan's lie is powerful. He's saying to Adam, he's saying to Eve, saying to all of us, it's so foolish to believe that God loves us. It is so foolish and stupid to believe that there's some cosmic plan. You should do and you can do whatever you want without eternal consequence. You don't deserve death or hell or, or sin. That's never going to happen. God is afraid of you. He's using scare tactics. He just wants you to be a slave. He's, it's like the Wizard of Oz, right? If you've seen the movie, he's just big voice. But behind it, he's just a broken person just like us. Well, the lie is taken, just like my cat. The belief was out there is better than in here. Paradise is lost, and paradise continues to burn today. Thousands of years later, Paul now recounts this painful past, our current place, but he also begins to paint our bright future because Genesis 3 was not the end of the story. It was the beginning. In 26 words, Paul does take some time to outline the consequences. Hear God's word today, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all have sinned. Okay, so all of us have been born into sin because of Adam, and don't miss this. He does not say sin originated with Adam. He says that Adam introduced sin into the world. Sin started with Satan, not Adam. But you can't just stop here. Paul has carefully, painstakingly chosen every single word. Notice again, he does this again. He says, sin singular. This is all the way back to chapter 3. Remember, this is what we call original sin. We are all, as human beings, under sin. Sinful actions come from us because we are under, this, under sin. We're under the dynamic of sin. We're under the power of sin. We're controlled by sin. Listen, I know what society says. I know what your friends say. I know what your professors teach. They're just wrong. We're not born innocent, and we learn bad things from parents and friends and family in society. Listen, we are born sinful, born with a bent towards sin, and born with a bent, a, a, a bent away from God. This is why it says in Psalm 51.5, I was sinful at birth. Actually, I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And one terrible result of sin, as it says in verse 12, is death. Oh, and death happens to human beings in three ways. First, it's separation from God. It's relational death between us and our creator. Oh, and then there's physical death, which all of us are going to experience, which leads to separation from loved ones and life itself, and even a weird separation for a period of time within yourself, for your soul is ripped from your body. And then, of course, the worst form is eternal death. Let me read this verse again. Read it with me slowly. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, 
And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now, I want you to remember that. We're going to get to this in a second. Because all sinned. But just before that. So because and since Adam, all human beings have faced and experienced death in all three ways. It's 100% guaranteed and fatal. And then right here, Paul does something so profound, so ground-shaking, so offensive. We've got to actually catch this. But we don't catch it in English. Because all have sinned. See that little phrase? Just circle it. Many of you are like, John, this is not a big deal. Like, sure, we've all sinned. I sin all the time. No, no, that's not what Paul is saying. See, if you read this in the original language in Greek, this is a complete action written in the past tense. You're like, Professor John, uh, what? Okay, ready? Paul is saying, this is like mind-blowing. Every human being, all of us, have sinned complete action at one point in history. No exceptions. You're like, John, I'm still lost. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that all of us, ready, were by proxy in Adam and sinned in Adam. We sinned in Adam with Adam. You're like, what? Okay, here's how one person works it out. Adam, according to the Bible, acted as a representative of the entire human race, including me and yourself, you. With the test that God set before Adam and Eve, he was testing the whole of humanity. Adam's name just means humanity, man, mankind. Adam was the first human being created. He stands at the head of the human race. He's placed in the garden not just to act for himself, but actually for all future descendants. Just as the federal government has a chief spokesperson who's the head of a nation, Adam is the federal head of everybody. The chief idea is that Adam sinned And he sinned for all of us. His fall was our fall. Our fall was his fall. So when God punished Adam by taking away his original righteousness, all of us were likewise punished. As literally the light bulbs are going off across Sanctus and beyond, people are getting really angry, saying, excuse me, Uh, that's not fair. Uh, I wasn't in the garden. If I was there, I would have made a better decision. I believe in rugged individualism. I've been taught my whole life that my choices will determine who I will be, how I will be successful, what I will do. And I have to believe in something for it to be true. And if I don't believe in it, it's not true. Well, actually, that's just not the way the world works. And that's not the way the Bible works. Let me pose this to you. I want you to imagine that our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, let me stop. Some of you love him, some of you don't. I just want to remind you, if you're a Christian, you better be praying for him. No matter what you think of him, he's your federal head. You loving him? Just ask him. Okay, different sermon. But if Justin Trudeau, at this moment, declares war on the United States, are you at war with the United States? You go, absolutely not. He's not my prime. Whoa, yes, he is. And guess what? If he declared war on the United States, every Canadian's at war with the United States, because he's our representative. And here's what's wild. Adam was our representative before God. And Adam, and we in him, fell. Three things happened. First, we're given a bad example, which we've all imitated. But you can't just stop there, because it wasn't just imitation, it was infection. Original sin has been with us since Eden. I love when Augustine said, Adam's condition, listen, Before the fall made it possible not to sin. After the fall, Adam and all of us with him fell into the condition, making it not possible not for us to sin. In other words, we can't help ourselves. We have to sin. So Paul says that we've got a bad person that we're imitating and also we're infected. But he actually says it goes one step farther. So anti-North American, so anti-everything you believe, and yet it's true. We were included in Adam when he fell. One person wrote it like this. Basic to the Christian worldview is a view that humanity is inherently bent away from God with all the tragedy that comes from the sinful condition. Indeed, Christianity offers at this point a succinct and convincing explanation for the human misery and hatred we see in the world all around us. Original sin may not make sense to many people. You may find it irritating or unjust or not fair. But what better explanation for the extent and persistence of crimes against humanity? When are we going to come to realize as humans that the genocide we see, we saw in Africa or what we saw in the 90s in Yugoslavia or actually what we're seeing right now in Iran or what we're seeing in North Korea or parts of China, what we're seeing in mass schools, like when are we going to start acknowledging it's not abnormal? 
That's not the oh my goodness moment. It's the normal moment. It's just another manifestation of the kind of hatred that has marked human beings forever. Oh, one last thought to really get you struggling and thinking. Well, we all had free choice in Adam. In the garden, we had it. And then we chose to walk away and give it up and break it. So we lost free choice related to salvation, not do I want a Big Mac or not, but to the ultimate things. When it came to relationship with God, we had it in Adam, we lost it in Adam, and that's why being good or spiritual or humanitarian or being kind or Canadian will never work. That's why Paul continually says that God has to call us back. We're not just sick, we're not just estranged, we're not just having a bad day, we're spiritually dead, spiritually alienated. We're, we, it literally takes someone to bring you back to life. Well, you're like, can you just stop? I said, well, I can't. We've got to keep going. There's a few more verses. After that huge, like, nuclear moment, Paul says, oh, I've got to deal with some random stuff, if I might. Oh, oh, to be sure, verse 13, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there's no law. Don't misunderstand what Paul's saying here. The law, like the Ten Commandments, defines sin, but sin existed before the law. Paul's point is the whole human race has experienced death and sin even before the law. Oh, nevertheless, verse 14, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. As Adam did, who is the pattern of one who is to come? Okay, notice this, it's huge. Adam is the pattern of the one who is to come. Paul is saying, ready? Adam is not mythological. He's a real historical figure, and he has to be. Why? Because as sin comes through one real person, so salvation will come through another real person found in history. Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God. If one is myth, then the other is myth. And if actually the Bible is just myth and, and actually not memory recounted, there's no grounding power or salvation. And that's Paul's point. From one earth-shattering event at Eden to a grander earth-shattering event at the cross, both are anchored in two real people. But the second person, Jesus, gives us rescue. He says in verse 15, the gift isn't like the trespass. I love the word trespass. You're not allowed to go there. For if the many died by the trespass of Adam, the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Okay, I love this. Paul says, I want you to look at Adam and I want you to look at Jesus. Put them side by side. They're so similar and so different. Maybe you've never thought about this. Do you realize that both of them were perfect when they were tempted? Ever thought about that? They both also represent humanity. Adam sinned. Jesus didn't. In Adam, we got judgment and condemnation and death. In Jesus, we get justification, reconciliation, atonement, mercy. But it's not universalism. Jesus is still the only way to heaven. He has to be accepted. It's to the many, not to the all. He says in verse 16, nor can the gift of God be compared with the results of one man's sin. The judgment followed one, uh, followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Jesus' death and resurrection overcomes original sin, that bad bent, and all the acts of sins we've all the acts of sin we've done, we've personally done, and overcomes all three forms of death, and overcomes the serpent in the garden. At this moment, it's like Paul is so excited that he goes, Oh. Shoot, I didn't finish what I was thinking back in verse 12. So then he says, look, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in the justification and life for all people. For just through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So Adam sealed the fate of all of us. And Jesus enables us and gives options to all to come home and move from condemnation to righteousness and right standing. The blessing is greater in Jesus. But notice what Paul says. Sin entered the world and condemned everyone. And you'll continue to live with that bent towards God and continue not have the ability not to sin. And you'll always continue to trespass and want to always go outside and run away unless you, of course, embrace Jesus. So then at this moment, Paul, as he's giving such hope and identity and worldview and assurance, his family gets upset again. They're like, 
but Paul, like, I mean, we're all Jews, and Paul, you're a Jew, and what about the Jewish religious community, and what about Israel, and what about the Old Testament, and what about Abraham and Moses, and is there no value at all? And Paul's like, oh, I've addressed this so many times, let me do it one more time. The law has brought in, the law was brought in so that trespass, ready, this is wild, would increase. What? Yeah, the law was brought in so there'll be more sin. Excuse me? But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is so good. Paul says, when the law was given, we all said, I want to sin more now because I know what's wrong. You ever done this before? You're on, in Toronto, we have this highway called the 401. And it's posted, go 100. And what do you say to yourself? Nope, not 100, 120. Why? Because it's the flow of traffic. It's so. You say, your mom and dad says, you know, we're not doing cookies tonight. What do you immediately think in your heart? Mm, no, it's a cookie night. They're like, it's not a cookie night. You said, you've now said it's not a cookie night, so I'm now declaring it's a cookie night. And what do you do? You go over and you put your hand in the cookie. Every time a law is given, we as humans go, let me see how far I can push that. So as the law is given, trespass increased. But the amazing thing is grace sort of went farther than trespass. I I found this story that really brings this home. Most of us have probably never heard of this guy. His name is Mel Trotter. He was a huge influence in the Christian movement in Chicago and actually the United States in the first half of the 20th century. Now, he was a hardcore alcoholic and he had fallen so low, so broken, so dark that on the evening where he met Jesus, he stumbles into this thing called Pacific Garden Mission and where he found Christ. At that moment, he was under the influence of alcohol, ready, that he had bought. And where did he get the money for the alcohol? He had just been at his young daughter's funeral. And she had died unexpectedly. And he walked in and stole his daughter's shoes out of the casket to buy the alcohol. Think about how broken and dark and screwed up that is. And this guy literally seen his daughter die, so broken, steals her shoes, sells the shoes, is drunk out of his mind, walks into a Christian mission, as they used to call them, and in that moment of huge darkness and pain, meets Jesus. What's so wild, if you read this guy's story, is that eight years later, he's a Presbyterian pastor. He becomes an outstanding evangelist. He found 67 of those recovery centers and missions from coast to coast. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. See, grace is stronger than darkness. Now, this is where this is going to get really uncomfortable and really biblical and really hopeful. There is nothing larger. There is no sin that is too dark for Jesus. I want you to think about the worst thing that you think is unforgivable. Just think about it right now. Abuse, rape, genocide, slavery... I want you to think about the thing in your heart where you go, that is so disgusting. Got it? Jesus died for that too. There is nothing so wicked, so bad, so sick, so shaming, so out of control that Jesus doesn't choose to forgive that also if the person wants forgiveness. It doesn't mean, by the way, there should be legal consequences. This is a much larger question. When Jesus said it is finished... He meant it is finished. No matter how great your sin is, the quality, the depth, the darkness, the disgustingness, the shamefulness of it, God's grace superabounds that stuff. No one, let me say this so loud, no one is beyond the grace of Christ because of the second Adam is stronger than the first Adam. You who are not followers of the second Adam, Jesus, What a day for you to think, to struggle, to be confronted with your sin and God's love. I was reading another pastor and he just wrote this so beautifully. I'm just like, I'm not even going to say it. This is for you if you belong to another faith, if you're spiritual, if you're not a Christian, if you're a Christian in name only. This is for you. As you read these words out of Romans, a great cosmic battle is raging within you. And as you've learned in the last few minutes, the battle is not between good and evil. Evil has already claimed your heart. No, no, the forces vying for your soul right now are guilt and grace. You've sinned. 
So guilt is an appropriate response. Oh, whether you feel it or not. Like many, you may have coped with guilt by, by, uh, of wrongdoing by a number of means like denial or minimize, minimization or distraction or blame shifting or maybe even spirituality or religion. Unfortunately, those things can't cover your guilt just like Adam's fig leaf couldn't cover disobedience. So God's answer, by the way, think about it, to Adam's sin could have been swift and severe. He could have spoken the universe out of existence as easily as he had spoken it into existence. And he would have been no less holy for doing so. In fact, many philosophers question how a good, all-powerful God can tolerate the presence of evil. The answer, again, is grace, undeserved favor, inexplicable, inexplic- inexplicable mercy. Rather than execute justice and reduce creation to a cinder, the Lord is moved by love. He confronts Adam with his sin. At the right time, the Lord confronts humanity with our sin by giving us the law. While the law is dangerous and deadly because it convicts and condemns those who sin, it's also God's means of grace. Through God's law, the Ten Commandments, His wrath blows into our garden and boldly urges us to come out of hiding. We're right to fear His wrath, but foolish to distrust His grace. I mean, after all, His chief desire, if His chief desire was to execute the just penalty of sin, He would have already done that. So you have a choice. Guilt, or grace. Uh, you may have either, by the way. You can remain in hiding, cling to your guilt, suffer the inevitable judgment of your sin, eternal agonizing separation from God, or you can stop hiding, stand before God, acknowledge your sin, admit your helplessness, and then receive this amazing gift of grace. God sent his son Jesus, the second Adam, to live a guiltless life we cannot live, to die an atoning death we deserve, to rise again and claim on our behalf salvation. A new kind of existence. His gift is free. It's extended by grace, received through faith. The question is, what do you do with the choice you're being given? Do you want guilt? Or do you want grace? Do you want Adam, number one, to be your representative? Or Adam, number two? And for someone who just said, neither of them are my representative. They are. You just have to accept reality and find hope. A lot of us listening to this, um, we're followers of Jesus. And as I took some time to reflect on this, it's really interesting. In our rapid, instant culture, many of us, if we're honest, we're like, John, I find sections of the Bible like this long and confusing and boring, and it's definitely gonna, not going to help me tomorrow with kids or at work or with my boss. But God did put this here for a reason. By the way, God is not saying that all of us have to be a biblical scholar or author or theologian, but he is saying something really needed. And remember why the Holy Spirit asked us to do this series was to resurrect a Christian worldview. He's reminding us that worship is also connected to us thinking correctly. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Where our heart and our head is, that's where we will act towards our others, others, ourselves, and God. We must work hard as Christians to understand, to worship not just with our time and not just with our service and not just with our money and not just with music and emotions, but also with our minds. We must bit by bit build a Christian worldview through Scripture. We have to submit under God's authority. Yes, reason is important. And yes, experience is amazing. And yes, church tradition is very helpful and good works are good. But they're just the moon compared to the son of God's word. Right thinking about God and God's work and world leads us away from false teaching, moves us away from inventing a God and a universe we're comfortable with, one we can manage and control, which is always idolatry. It moves us to pray differently, love differently, speak differently, trust God more, see the world through heaven's view. So struggle. Struggle and pray and wrestle because the long, honest struggling with what we think about the scriptures and what they're really saying, even if they offend us, will bring us closer to Jesus. And, and this is a big and, if you worship with your mind and read tough passages like this, You'll become what you're called to be. Uh, One parting last thought for us who are followers of Jesus. As we've reflected once again today on the vastness and the seriousness of our sin and the greatness of our rescue, once again, this hope thing is just so strong. It was Ambrose, one of the great Christian church fathers who we'll all hang out with in the new heavens and the new earth who understood the value of a Romans 5 in everyday life. His, um, a very close friend of his had died, maybe his brother, maybe. 
And he was like totally devastated. And it's wild as I was reading this. This is what he prayed and preached at his brother's funeral. He said, in Adam I fell. In Adam I was cast out of paradise. And in Adam I died. How shall God call me back except he find me in Adam? For just as in Adam I'm guilty of sin and owe a debt to death, so in Christ I'm justified. In other words, there's a hope in the second Adam who's more powerful than death, hope that keeps us, sustains us, hopes that does not invent escapism, but actually produces perseverance. I love this passage because it answers the question, why is there so much evil in the world? I love this passage because this this resolves the question of free will and not free will. I love this passage because it also shows us the seriousness of our lostness and the unbelievable love of God. I love this passage because it actually shows us what God's up to. Let's just keep praying in this moment that what God has begun in this series would flesh itself out fully. So let's pray it like this. God, for us who are Christians, help us to be more and more comfortable with your word. Help us to submit more, be formed more, to find joy more in your word. Help us to struggle well, argue well, wrestle well with you. But actually, the real request is God continue to build a robust Christian worldview where we worship well, we think well, and we act well. Lord, I pray for hope for lots of people today that are Christians, that they just know how good you are, how loving you are, and what you've done. And I do pray for so many listening right now who have not encountered Jesus. Bring them back from the dead. Open their eyes. May this be the day where guilt loses and grace wins. Yeah, thanks, Lord, that you didn't leave us um, wandering and outside of the garden, but you brought us back home. In Jesus' name, amen.